one of the hardest messages to hear in spiritual practice. And perhaps one of the most misunderstood is the idea that you are already perfect as you are. Almost everybody in a spiritual practice is trying to arrive at some kind of perfection, some kind of completion. So when these teachers come and tell you in this sort of Advaita school of yoga that you are already what you're looking for, it just doesn't make sense. And it always brings up this issue of, but, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I'm not this, I'm not that, I should have done this, I should have done that. It goes on and on and on in terms of all the reasons you're not perfect as you are. All of your reasons are wrong. All of your buts are mistakes. I know that because of how much I love each of you. And I know it because of how much Rudy loved me. Rudy didn't love the spiritual part of me, the pure part of me, the part that I might become someday. He didn't love me because my heart was open or not open. He didn't love me because my kundalini had rised, risen, or not. He just loved me. And that total, unconditional, accepting love was why I'm sitting here today. I am and was no different than anybody in this room. I always felt that I had to arrive at a place of being worthy. I could count, as each of you can, all the things that are wrong with me, and probably not all of the things. I just had a sense that there was a lot more. Anyone who looks at oneself as an ego entity sees all of the seven deadly sins. We're all imperfect on some level, but it in no way affects our perfection. The idea of spiritual work implies that you have stuff to fix. And in terms of your ego identity, that's absolutely true. Everyone in this room has stuff to fix. That would make you a lot healthier if you could get that part of you together. If you stopped certain patterns of behavior or thought, something in your brain that keeps making you somehow less than you think you could be. And one of the great things about Rudy's practice 
was that he gave you work to do. And he gave you work to do on yourself. Did you have to do that work really? No. Probably not. On the other hand, without doing the work that Rudy gave me on myself, I don't think I could have ever arrived at this place where I really saw that I was fine. That I was fine as I am. Somehow I had a lot of clearing away to do. I had a lot of stuff that had to be thrown out. I had to make peace with all aspects of my psyche and personality. I had to sit really quietly for years and decades, sitting and sitting and sitting and going into these places of extraordinarily beautiful, simple states of being. Every time I would lose that state of being, which was all the time, I would go, what did I do wrong? What's not right in me? Why don't I have the ability to stay in endless permanent bliss? Something is clearly not evolved enough. It never dawned on me that you're not meant to live in endless permanent bliss. Endless permanent bliss is an unnatural state. People talk about it endlessly in <clears throat> spiritual terms. When you finally reach whatever it is you reach, nirvana, samadhi, perfection, that you're in this in eternal joy. But what you arrive at, really, as you evolve into an understanding of your perfection, is that you are one with this. You are one with the miracle of your own life. That the manifested world is you. That the extraordinary mixture of good and bad, positive, negative, is what makes you who you are. And that for you to want to be only one part of the spectrum is where the problem comes in. Because you can't be all, someone once described it to me as tick and not talk. It's tick talk that makes the universe work. It's not tick, 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 or talk, 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 talk. It's the yin and the yang. I don't discount the value of spiritual practice, of working to get purer, quieter, simpler, more open, more available. It's all good. And it probably makes this awareness of your perfection easier to come by. But anybody with enough trust and belief could do it right now. Anybody. Meaning, each of you. You don't have to wait till you're 80 years old or 60 years old or whatever. You don't have to go on endless pilgrimages. You don't have to do anything other than stop and look and go, ah. Oh. That's all it is. Ha. Huh. Finished. You're there. You're there because you're there right this second. You are there right this moment. And every single part of you that comes up and denies that is what has to finally be surrendered. Every little thing that starts to arise in this moment and tries to say, he can't be right. He's wrong. What he's, I can't buy into what he's saying because I know I'm not worth it. I know I'm shit. I know I'm this. I know I'm that. That voice in you kind of is the problem and is also part of the perfection. Only when you accept that voice of going, ah, yeah, here it goes again. The old voice. And you label it. You look at it and you go, there's a reason for this voice. 
There's a reason for something that negates what I am. There's a reason for something that tears me down. There's a reason for something that builds me up into something that's not real. What is that thing that is always going on and causing all of this strange suffering? What is this in myself? And all I can tell you is work your asses off to find out. And the only way you will find out is by looking at it. Not by believing it, because it's going to come up all the time. It's either going to tell you you're the best thing that ever happened or you're the worst thing that ever happened or some mixture of the two. And you will always be pulled one way and pulled another way and you will suffer that lack of truth. Because you are not the worst thing that ever happened and you're not the best thing that ever happened. You're just right. And that all of this drama that goes on inside you goes on in everyone. And we're all victimized by it. And you don't even know where it comes from until you look at it. Until you sit there and go, I'm not moving until this thing tells me why it's telling me these things. Why doesn't it like me? Or why don't I like me? Or why do I think I'm not right as I am? Why? What is this thing that's going on all the time? What is this dance? And if you start to stare at it, not that you'll understand it, because you may not come to a clear answer to that question, but you will come to a revelation of where it's coming from. And you will see this thing rise up, and it wants more than anything to, in a sense, manifest control. It wants to dominate you. It wants to run the show. And the problem is, we let it. We've let it from day one. Well, not quite day one, but somewhere like about two years old. It starts to take hold. And we really believe what it's saying. And it has the ability to punish us, and it has the ability to extol us, and we all feel that we are the recipients of beneficiaries or victims of this voice that's within us. What do you do to get past that? What do you do to get past this thing that doesn't let you rest, that doesn't let you find peace, that doesn't let you find joy in yourself? <laughs> I'll use my simple example. You sing to it. You just sing. You just go. I used to use this, Hello darkness, my old friend. I'm here to talk to you again. And you start to have this interaction with this self-critical quality. And you just go, I know how much you need to express yourself, but I don't need to buy your conclusions. I don't need to do it. I can be free of you. I'm not trying to diminish you. I'm not trying to tell you that you don't have a reason for doing what you're doing. I honor your need to make an ego-minded entity function in the world. And I know how powerful it is when lack of satisfaction and a lack of ambition or over-ambition and drive, I know how important they are to the construct of human life. I get it. I get why this ego mind is so potent and so powerful and why it has such power. But, enough. Enough. I've been there. I've done that. And you just say to it, peace. Now you may have to say that 5,000 times or 10,000 times, over and over and over. You have to look at this thing in yourself that wants to rear its head. And if you're one of those lucky people where this voice is locked in the basement, trust me, it will start knocking on the door at some point. It will be there. I found it was there at 4 a.m. The middle of the night voice. If you wake up, if any of you have had this, and I've talked to a lot of people who have, at 4 a.m. it goes... And you don't want to pay attention to it. And you can kind of squelch it for a while, but the older you get, and the more weak the ego gets, the more it starts to break through the cracks, the more it starts to come through and announce itself. And it announces itself with an enormous amount of judgment. 
and at four in the morning you are defenseless. It will sound like the most intelligent voice ever and it will sound like truth and there's nothing you can do to overwhelm it. You can't, you can't argue it out of existence. Singing helps. The other thing that helps is no matter how dark the sky that it presents, somewhere in the middle of that you love somebody. I don't care who you love. You love somebody. And if you can make your way through the darkness to that love and that tiny little bit of light, like one star in the darkest sky, you can enter that light and it's bigger than the darkness. It obliterates the darkness. And you can then begin to experience the clear light of reality, the mixture of light and dark the oneness of light and dark, the yin and yang of your existence. And when you start to see that and you sign a truce with your own critical entity, with your own ego-suffering mind, what happens is you begin to accept yourself as you are, you begin to say yes to the totality of your being and something occurs where you are no longer at war with yourself and you find peace, real peace. That doesn't mean that the ego won't have its moments. That doesn't mean that there won't be times of anxiety, that won't be times of of, of fear, there won't be times of not knowing. All of this stuff can still be there, but you go yes to it. You go yes. And as you go yes to this doubting, you go yes to the, the imperfect mind presenting itself, there's a bigness in you that encompasses everything. And I will tell you, at some instant in this ongoing process of saying yes to what is, a clarity grows and every bit of that thing that's seeking something else vanishes. And there's just what is. There's no you and it. There just is. And you realize that's what you are. You are what is. Whatever that may be. And it will be whatever is in that exact moment. So the phone rings and it's, and it's a um, crank call. One of those calls that disturbs you at dinner. It's not like the universe is punishing you. It's not like you have to get angry at the person and slam the phone and go, why me, God? You know, you just go, sorry, not interested, and you hang up. It's just a thing that came up. Life, life completely, and every aspect, is part of your perfection. Not just this part, not just that part. The totality is what you are. There is nothing you are not. And once you start to sit back and just go, yes, or thy will be done, whatever the line is that works for you. Marty Shorewood said today, the line is, I'm 70. I get it. I get it. I don't have to give in to this anymore. I don't have to give in to that. I, I've been there. It's so releasing. It's so liberating. And you start to realize, I am all there is. And if there's anything... I want to give everybody in this room to take away from here is that you're already there. You could not be there. You're already free. You could not be free. You're already completely liberated, awakened, enlightened beings. You just aren't paying attention. You're just caught in your drama. You're caught in your bullshit. You think that it's real. You pay endless attention to it because it's a habit. But all you have to do is go, no, I'm done. Enough. Enough. Please. Finish. And then this 
in comes through and it's like, ah, ah. And you feel whole. You just feel whole. And life is extraordinary. I have to say, it's beyond extraordinary. The wonder and the beauty and the gratitude that follows moment to moment to moment is the very thing you've been looking for and it's the very thing that arises naturally. There you are. You go, yes, thank you. I mean, I, I, it's hard to describe the sense of the endless miraculous aspect of your own life. And I tried, I think, in a talk a few, a few weeks ago to explain the fact that there is a platform, the fact that there is a pillow, the fact that there is light coming from electrical outlets in the ceiling and light bulbs, the fact that there are these amazingly beautiful, wonderful people sitting here, the fact that somebody designed these windows, that these paintings were done, that that statue exists, that we are in the middle of who knows where, we call it Big Indian, the country, we're in the world, we're somewhere, and this extraordinary connection is happening with all of us. We are in this place of Sangha, of sharing truth. When did you go to a movie and they shared truth last? When did you turn on the television and they shared truth the last time? When did you sit in a group with friends at dinner and they spoke truth? When? It doesn't happen very often. Where you get to hear this, where you get to share it, where you get to have your mind go, really? Poss could that be possible? I'm perfect. I am already there. Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> It's not possible, it's true. It's absolutely true, it's a miracle. You are a walking, sitting, breathing miracle. And you don't have to wait to get there. It's not gonna happen on your deathbed, it's happening right now. And if it doesn't happen now, it probably won't happen on your deathbed. Or maybe it will. But if it happens on your deathbed, you missed all of this. This is an amazing ride. You're alive to this. And it's not, I'm like, oh God, another day. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, another day. Who knew? Who knew what was going to come that day? You never know. You never know what's going to arise. And it's always amazing. Always. I mean, I just go on the internet and there's my emails. I, go, oh, I hear from people I didn't think I'd ever hear from. You know, pff, wow. You know, out of nowhere, somebody reached out to me and said they love me. I, it's like shocking. Shocking. And there's no reason for it. But I just, I'm so grateful. You know, I'm in the car, and of course it's all my songs that I programmed, but every song that comes on, I go, wow, how did they know what, <laughs> they, knew what they, they knew what mood I was in. They absolutely captured my day. And, and, they, and they throw out the songs in a way that's like, that's the exact emotional arc that I wanted to be on. It happens all the time, and more and more. The more I settle into the miracle of my life, the more miraculous it is. And every one of you who's sitting here going, it can't happen to me, that's wrong. It's wrong. I know you're thinking, well, I never got the job I wanted. I never got the girl I wanted. I never got the thing I wanted. Let go of that. Let go of what you didn't get. I know that's hard, but that's why you suffer. Because you're holding on to the thing that didn't happen, or should have happened, or the thing that did happen, and you wished it didn't happen. You know, you're all, you're all holding on to all of this stuff that defines a life and makes it a life of suffering. Let it go. Let it go. Rudy said, surrender. I'm telling you, that's it. And if you know that you, you're perfect, then just accept, in my perfection, I got some bum deals. In my perfection, I didn't get the job I wanted. You know, I lose things all the time. I mean, I didn't get a, a writing job recently. It was like nothing to me. It's like, okay. If it comes, I do it. If I don't, if it doesn't come, I don't do it. There's no suffering here, you know. The, you just you take your life as it arises. You take it as it is, and you go, thank you, thank you. And there's none of you who isn't blessed in that way. And if you think you're not blessed in that way, it's because you're thinking. Stop thinking. Be the person you are. Be what you are. You know. Again. I, it would be so amazing to me if every one of you went pop, 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 pop. You know, oh my God, he's right, he's right, he's right, he's right. And we all just walked out of here. There would be no more classes probably. We'd just sit around and <laughs> play poker. I don't know. You know, we'd have a great time. But the fact is, it's, you know, I could talk like this till, till the end of time and it would still not sink in. And I keep going, why doesn't it sink in? It's so simple. 
But I know why, because I was there. I was exactly where a lot of you think you are. And I said, there's no way I could be a perfect human being, an enlightened person, because of, and I had a list. It went on and on and on. And then they just took the list, they being whatever, Rudy called it the guys upstairs, I don't know what it is. They just took the list and went, <laughs> go on. I, I mean, the moment of awakening was so shocking to me because there was just no more Bruce. There was no more, there was no more this. I mean, there was a body and there was a, clearly a mind and a person, but everything it identified with, everything that it held dear, just suddenly went, Phew. and not that I didn't still love my wife and my children and grandchildren and all of you, but it was, I loved a lot more people. And I kind of loved everybody on some level. And I get look, I look at people all day long, and I go, I, first of all, I go like my mother-in-law when she was demented. I go, I know them. I know that person. Why do I know them? You know? But I really do. I really know them. And I, lo and I love them. And I have no idea why I love them, but I do. And it's that kind of thing. And everything speaks to me. Television commercials speak to me. The newspaper speaks to me. Somebody talks to me at a, at a party, and suddenly I'm going, oh my God, what a revelation that was. You know, they have no idea that they were giving me a revelation, but people give you all the time. Life is so rich and so dense and so full and so beautiful and horrible and scary and, so, and painful. It's all of that. It's the whole mix. You know, I knew that when I was a baby, and I look at my, my grandson Elijah, and I could see he's going, huh. Because it's, he cries and he laughs and he cries and he laughs and, you know, it's, it's a complete endless mixture of stuff. That's what we're living in. This life is holy. This life is God. People say, where is God? I don't see God. What do you mean you don't see God? What do you think you're looking at? What do you think this is? You know? And people say, well, it's just stuff. Yeah, but... How and why and where, and I mean, the miracle of tracing anything back to its source is the reality that you are in the presence of the absolute divine all the time. And not only are you in the presence of it, you are it. You are divine in your substance. And you walk around not knowing that and not thinking that and not believing that and being like, why well, wasn't he shut up already, you know? I can't shut up because if you figure this one out, if you walked out of here and knew this, you would be transformed by the very fact of it, and nothing would change except you would go, ah, oh, ah. Oh. You know, you get in your car and you go, God, this seat's comfortable. They have little things for my fingers on the steering wheel. Yeah. I mean, they've thought of everything. They've, they've thought of everything. And why are you so completely supported by the universe? It's kind of astounding, really. Why does it happen? I can't tell you. But I know it's an act of love. It's an act of love. And yes, there are mistakes and tragedies and all these things that happen, but every mistake and tragedy leads to love. It takes you back to God. Every bit of suffering takes you back to God, or whatever you want to call that force from which you emerged, the unborn, the, the, the holy grail, the center of existence. Everything takes you back to that. The worst suffering in the world, that's the, only, that's the only place you can go to. The only place you have to be comforted by life is yourself. And it takes you in. It just takes you in. And sometimes it takes pain and suffering to get there. But if that's what it takes and you get there, it's worth it. All of us, all of us return to the self, all of us emerge from the self, and at no point along the way are we separate from it. Not for one billionth of a second. So if you're not separate from yourself at any point, why are you not aware of yourself? Why are you not living in the authentic expression of yourself? I mean, that's really the crazy question of human life. Why are we living these crazy, stupid lives? Suffering and blaming people, and my mother should have done this, and they didn't listen to me in school, and I, all that stuff. That's the blaming game that keeps you from going, I am one with all there is, and in that there is no struggle, there is no fight, there is no search, there is no hoping for something. It's here. It's here now. Really here. And that's all I have to tell you.
And, and the problem is I'm running out of ways to tell you. So <laughs> I have this tape. You can listen to it, you know, down the road. And if, if, you've, you know, and if I don't ever talk again, you can just turn it on. And it will never, it'll always be the same message. There's no other message. I have nothing else to tell you. In every possible way I can figure it out, I will tell you this one thing. And you can spend the rest of your life meditating, the rest of your life trying to get to what I'm talking about, or you can just tell them. Your choice, really, literally, your choice. And if you feel like you need to spend 50 years sitting, God knows Rudy told us it was a life's work, and it is. It's a life's work. Or, at some point, you can just go, okay, and you're enlightened. It's that simple. So? Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Done. Are there any questions about any of this? Can you say that again, Bruce? <laughs> 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 That's, that's actually the, the usual the response. I'm not sure I get what you're saying. <laughs> you know? um, I'm so, I think what you're saying is so beautiful, so profound, and so beautiful. And I hate to say it, but I don't want to be that person today. But I am confused <laughs> on a very deep level of the, the I see the perfection of the union, but when it's so out of balance, say the yang, like for instance the environment, and it's great that we have comfortable cars, we love to drive in, we can really, we're really blessed, everyone in here, we're not in a third world country, with, you know, dealing with bombs going off and, and dealing with that, who knows how they actually feel, because that's just so far away from our actual experience or anything that we know. I have a really close friend who's there all the time, I can tell you, I don't think they feel that that is God. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm just saying, and I think things like the environment, the darkness, the real darkness of it, but also projections and scientists saying what's to come. Can you talk about how to see that as perfection? Or how to maybe become part of the solution rather than just accepting it in this blissful state that doesn't feel, I don't know, to me, like, being in reality. Well, I mean, this, this, this exact kind of question has been asked now for thousands upon thousands of years. It's really the central question. And it's a much more authentic question if you were in Gaza or in Ukraine or if you were wherever this was going well, I'm on. I'm a brain tumor starter. I deal with chronic no, pain. That's so I, I, I'm not dealing with perfection every day in the right. West. Well, but to ask I wake you, up with nerve pain that's called a suicide disease. So yes. I definitely I, do. I, I know. I, understand, I really do understand <laughs> the, the So although of, I'm not there, I'm there in some different reality. Well, then the question should come from that. Sure. As opposed to, I mean, we can all talk about Gaza, and we can all talk about the Ukraine, and we can all talk about the climate. And, and maybe the climate's more immediate for all of us, although right at this moment it's one of the most beautiful days I've been in in a long time in Big Indian. And the, there will always be a very powerful struggle between light and dark in the manifested world. It will never be otherwise. And we will all be touched by it in some way, either immediately or indirectly. For me, much of what's happening in Gaza, I don't mean to diminish it on any level, but it's all re relative to the size of the television screen I'm watching and the two minutes that they have talking about it on television. And that's the reality. It's coming into my life through an electronic medium or a newspaper. And I can go, oh my God, this is killing me. And I, and I kind of do sometimes because it's so painful to even get a glimpse of what all of that is. But we're not living in it. And if you're living in it, that's your life and your drama and your connection with the universe. And you have to figure stuff out from that perspective. And yes, it's a dynamic, dynamic teaching. And the fact that we're not there is a blessing right now. Could we be there in a year or in two days? Sure. And then we'll have a different discussion. You know, the, the world is full of upheaval and pain and every one of us is going to die and every one of us is probably going to feel pain in that process and some are going to live with it as, as you have been living with pain, you know. But when you sit back inside, and I, and I 
have, I've had, a year ago I talked a lot on these talks about my shoulder pains, which were, I couldn't sleep at all for, for months, and it was horrible. And finally there was nothing I could do. There was no medication that I could take that would stop anything. And I finally just said, I give up. I just give up. I, I will sleep what I, when I can sleep. I will get two hours and I'll do whatever I have to do. And it all started to shift. Because I stopped being at war with the pain. I just went, this is what it is. Could I do that all the time? I don't know. If it was pain in extremity that was going to lead me to death, then I would just have to go, go on that ride. You know, it's a ride where none of us are going to escape it, really. You know, and that's a heavy-duty thing and for the existential part of our brain and part of our mind. But it's not happening now. It's just not happening at this moment. And so to invest in what could happen, what might be happening, or what is happening elsewhere is not the same as living in your truth in your moment. And if you want, Rudy would say this, if you want to save the world, go do it. Go out there and do it. Go to Gaza, and, or, or go to wherever you think, whatever side of the war you want to fight on, and pick up a gun and enter into the battle, but you don't need to do that. You've not been called karmically into that situation. So don't bring it into the equation. Yes, it's part of the existential truth of our lives, and we are all very connected, and I get really sad watching people whose children have just been killed and whose parents and brothers. I mean, it's, it's a horrific part of the universe. But does it deny the totality of the glory and beauty of God? Not for me. I don't get God. I don't get the arrangement exactly of all of this stuff. But I will tell you that from my own limited perspective and from some people that I've met who've had some what I would call the worst human experiences, it led them to something beautiful. That's all I can tell you. I've talked a lot about this guy I met on the plane whose son was drowned in the backyard by a father-in-law who was not paying attention. And this, the journey this guy had to go on, his four-year-old son was, died, he took me through that journey. And he arrived at a place of such <clears throat> acceptance and beauty. And his father-in-law didn't. And he had to tell his father-in-law, you know, you can't come back in my house if you don't turn this around because I'm not going to take your suffering. I can't. You have to work it through the way I worked it through. And he didn't work it through by avoiding it or ignoring it. He went into the core of it. And that's the only place you can go. And what do you find at the core? Refuge. Refuge. Deep refuge. You get hugged by... Um, um, what's your name? Amanda? Amanda? Oh, um, yeah. You know, and it, and it does wonders for you. It's just a hug. It's a hug. It's and refuge. Shakti, yeah. And Shakti. You know, I'll hug you. Everyone everyone here can hug each other. You will get a momentary release. But the release that works forever, it's here. And all we can do in the midst of horrific suffering is find our way back to this place. And it takes you in my experience. And I can't tell you this is absolute truth, but it felt like absolute truth. It's that arrival at that moment of return is so profoundly beautiful. It is indescribable in any terms human beings can relate to. It is indescribably loving and great, grateful and embracing and thankful for your being and for your suffering. You know, it, it's learning, it's learning through you. It's experiencing itself through you. And it says, thank you for this because it needs to know what it is. That's the way I interpret it. Or it needs to express itself to be what it is. And what it is is brutal and big and vast and overwhelmingly dynamic, and we're in it. It's not a light little thing. Life's not a light little thing. It's, it's, it's battle zone. But somehow or another, we exist in that, and most of the time, it's unbelievably I was going to say beautiful. For some people, it's ugly. But whatever it is, it is. And the minute you take it as it is, it's no longer something you're in battle with. The battle is its own thing, but you don't have to be in battle with it. And therefore, you're one with it. And when you're one with something beautiful or ugly, you're no longer in conflict with it. And the battle falls away. You just go, thy will be done. I get it. I am that. And we are all that. And it's an extraordinary thing to recognize that that's what you are. And, and if you want to really grow spiritually, it's to take the bigness of that and go, 
okay. That, that too. That's a big spiritual practice. That too. Even this. Even this. And you open to this, and you open to this, and you open to this, and you find how vast you are. Will you understand it? I don't understand it. You know, and I don't call God into account. I just don't. Because I am aware that there is a mystery here that is so profound and so amazing to me that not understanding it is fine. Because I don't think it's comprehensible. I don't. And I don't know what I would do if I comprehended it. And who am I to comprehend anything? It would be me and that. And there is no me and that. There's no you and it. There's only what is. So who's there to, to understand it or to fight it? Just be it. Long answer. Mm -hmm. Jessica, did you have a question? I think you answered my question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? It's getting late, I know. Okay. Again, for those of you who are here tomorrow, um, it's probably going to be the same thing. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so, you don't have to come. <laughs> yeah, right. I, 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 I keep wanting to find a way out of having to keep talking. <laughs> because I don't know what more to say, kind of, but I keep finding that I do it. And, and I do think it has to keep getting through until it connects. It just, it, I don't know why it takes so long to connect. I just don't get it. It took me forever. I just want to say thank you for helping us remember. Well, that's a good way to put it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no. It, it is a remembering. Remember this more than we. Than you and your drama. Yes. And that, to me, and, and just being in community like this helps me remember. Yes, I think that's exactly how it works, and for me too, you know? I mean, I, you know, I don't plan this thing. I just sit here, and it has its own voice, and it speaks its truth, and, and, and I learn from it the same way you do. And it's absolutely extraordinary to me because it's so real. It's just so real. It's, I, don't, I, don't know what, I, don't, I don't have any argument with it, you know? I mean... I mean, I, I, I take Tara's question as very serious, and, and I get it, but I, I, can't, I can't argue with the fact that the world is what it is. And, and, and you can come to some conclusion that it's meaningless and empty and, and has no purpose, and which you may be right, by the way, or you can have this experience that I have of having this little granddaughter and now a little grandson, and I hug them, and I experienced something that I've said many times already was worth incarnating for. I would come into this world for that love. And if there was nothing but that love, it's enough. It's totally enough. And anyone here who has someone they love knows what I'm talking about. You know, how do we get so lucky? And if you don't have anyone you love enough, go deep and you will find one that you love yourself and two that yourself loves everything. It is in love with life, with its own creation, even the parts of it that it destroys. Okay. Bruce, what I was going to ask about, which I feel like you spoke to, kind of came back. And I think, for me at least, the struggle of, um, I don't know how to stop talking because I feel like I'm saying you know, what you just said. Like, like uh, this is the message. For me, what gets challenging to hear in this message is this perfection and what Tar is bringing up, right? Because so much of reality that we experience, or as you're saying, some of us don't, others do, is actually, you know, what some people call evil or ugly or, you know, what you said earlier is like this worst human experience. Absolutely. And, and so when you say perfection, it doesn't encompass that for me. It does, well, and, but, and I also understand how it does, too, right? And, you know, I mean, in, in some of the communities that I walk with, most of the people that I spend time with don't have food on a regular basis, right? That's pretty extreme human experience. Most people get invited to funerals on a weekly basis for years. That's extreme human experience. And I also would say that they could identify with what you're talking about, about embracing and feeling that love and feeling that care 
as a result of the ugly. But I don't think that they would say perfection, and it doesn't come to me in that understanding. So to me, I just offer that to say that perhaps sometimes it's also about the language, which is, you know, always a problem. Ab right? Absolutely. It's perfection is a very, is a, it's a weird word to use, but, mm. but. And it's also uh, appropriate, too. Well, uh, in a way. And exactly what you're saying is all I can say. It is perfect and imperfect. It is right and it's wrong. That there are no words to really explain what's going on here. You know, we try as best we can. I will tell you what I, what, what I feel as you speak is how all of that imperfection, to use that word, has created this unbelievably compassionate soul who goes into the world to help the world. That's what it does. You're not one of those people who sits home and reads a newspaper and feels terrible. You go to South Africa, you, go, you, do, you do the work. That's real. That's, it's your path. Your path is absolutely part of the inspiration from the suffering of other people. You need to be there for them. Even as you're speaking now, the passion, the feeling, the emotion is so powerful. And it is so, it's, it's so beautiful on so many levels. And I get what you're saying, and I really, I think it's smart. I think the lack of, perf of that, the perfection is a bad word. I don't, I don't use it easily, and I don't use it lightly. But I don't have a better one exactly, but I understand completely what you're saying. And I'm not trying to deny the suffering in the world, but I have been in India at, and with kids who were hungry, who, oddly enough, were happier than kids I know in America who are, have, many, have three meals a day. I don't know how to explain that. All I know is it's not, our minds don't get it. Our minds will never get it. They're very tiny, and this is big, you know, and we do the best we can. But let go of your little tiny mind, and you will get it on a very big level. It will not change your passion. It will not change, if anything, it will enhance it. But it will no longer be from a place of judgment of this is good, this is bad, this is evil. This, it's all one thing, and it's what you are. And you are very in it. You're in the middle of it. That's a very particular kind of life. You know, be it. And, but, but I don't want this argument to end on, on, on semantics. Right. Because the semantic version of this is, yes, the word is probably wrong, but that doesn't mean what I'm saying is wrong. It just means I don't have the words for it either. But I will tell you, you are the thing you're looking for. And the world needs you. Daniel. I don't, uh, I thought maybe this is, is something to offer is, um, is a quote from Padmasambhava uh, and there's sort of a Tibetan tradition of like this, this kind of outlook which is um, you know like the two wings of a bird they say like relative truth and ultimate truth you need both you know <coughs> to fly and uh, Padmasambhava said my view is as vast as the sky but my attention to to uh, cause and result to my actions is as fine as barley flour. You know? And so there's that sense of like, you, you have that view of perfection, but that doesn't stop you from trying to, to help others and to benefit others and, and to relieve suffering. It's like, it's like when you wake up in a lucid dream, you know you're dreaming. You know, you can, you can, do, you can still act in the dream knowing you're dreaming to make it a better dream. You know, yeah, like that. no, well that's exactly right. I, I, and I, obviously can't say it better myself, you know, I mean, I know, I, I describe it as, as the wave and the particle, which is a depiction by scientists and, and physicists of what light is. Light is a wave and a particle all at the same time, and it depends on how you look at it. One way, the wings are going like this, another, it's a grain of barley. The ego is the barley, this is our self, you know, and we either live in one or the other, and most people live almost always in the barley, and are shocked by the bigness of the wings. Mm -hmm. Some people live in the wings, you know, and seem to be sort of out of touch with this, mm -hmm. but the totality is you're both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the part of you that's in the world has the characteristics of your ego, mind, personality, but it's also very in touch with the largeness, and it has wildly big compassion mm -hmm. and love for all that is. And it doesn't become dysfunctional. It brings love to whatever is in front of it, which is the simplest way to live. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you can go to Africa, you can go to all these places, you can do that, but the world that's in front of you needs you as well, and that's the world that you have. And if you're led to these larger adventures, go, because that's what your path is. But the path is just as real and important if you just simply look at the person in front of you, which is often where your own struggle is. You know, Rudy always said the hardest part in the mandala is the, the center, where you love everybody in the periphery, mm -hmm. but go to the center of the mandala, like mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, and you know what, you want to be around them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the work. When you awaken, it's to that. Mm -hmm. It's that's the work, and they will always be there. And you work through that, and it goes bigger and bigger and bigger, and your embrace is for all that is, which is including you. Okay.